And before I get into that, oh, sorry. Yes, I did want to go that way. So uh, we're, we're really thrilled today to have Sarah Oleksak with um, the Department of Energy joining us. She works to increase electric vehicle charging access across the country as coordinator of the Department of Energy's EV Everywhere Workplace Charging Challenge. This nationwide initiative aims to increase the number of employers offering worksite charging by tenfold over the next five years. Prior to launching the challenge earlier this year, Sarah managed the technical component of the $25 billion Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Loan Program and also chaired the department's assistant management board for early career leaders. She holds an MS in Energy Policy and Climate from Johns Hopkins University and a BS from Musking, Musking um, University. Sorry, Sarah. Um, and with that, let me go ahead and turn over the presentation to Sarah. All your stuff. So um, I don't know, did you have those other poll questions? Yes, they're, they're right after this slide. Oh, fantastic. Okay, um, thank you so much for that introduction. It's Muskingum, and it's in uh, Muskingum County by the Muskingum River in Ohio. So if anybody is on from Ohio, they may be remotely familiar with that. So um, thanks to Stephanie and Phil and Naveen from Cutter for setting this up and inviting uh, me to, be, to participate here today. And thank you all for calling in. So we're interested in learning a little bit more about the types of individuals on the call and why you're interested in listening in today. Um, we've spoken, so if you want to go ahead and, and vote on this question, why are you participating? Um, we've talked to a lot of times we often preach to the choir and talking to the other EV enthusiasts and EV supporting organizations. Um, a lot of times we are also just speaking to companies who are hearing about our activities for the first time. So the nature of today's conversation will be a presentation given in the form of explaining the benefits of workplace charging and the workplace charging challenge to an employer. So for, um, for the, I'll speaking, be speaking more to those uh, answering with the, the red and the blue. But also, I'm hoping to continue the conversation with those who have answered in the yellow and green about what we are doing. The next question is, what are your thoughts on workplace charging? How important is it now, and how important is it in the future? Not important now, not important in the future, not important now, but will be in the future, or important now and will continue in the future. All right, we have some very enthusiastic people, so um, great audience today, um, although, of course, it's always good to have some critics um, in the audience, but I'm glad to, to see that, that folks seem uh, pretty supportive of what we're doing here. So let me tell you about why we at the federal government are interested in workplace charging. This falls under our newer EV Everywhere Grand Challenge, which was uh, launched by President Obama in 2012, and the goal of the EV Everywhere Grand Challenge is to make America the first to produce plug-in electric vehicles that are both as affordable and convenient as gasoline-powered vehicles by 2022. These efforts fall under a couple of different categories. If you've worked with my office, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at DOE before, you know that a large portion of our funding goes to the funding of research and development to bring down the cost of batteries, bring down the weight of materials, everything that will help us produce uh, better electric vehicles in the future. We also are working on uh, best practices and efforts to deploy charging station infrastructure, which our activity falls under. And, of course, we also care about uh, helping out consumers understand the benefits of electric vehicles. So while there are needs in all three of these areas, today we're talking about um, our efforts to build charging infrastructure through the Workplace Charging Challenge. 
This slide shows just a chart. If you're not familiar with the rise of PEV sales in the U.S., this data shows that um, we are well on our way to um, continuing the growth of EVs in the U.S. We hit the uh, 100,000th PEV sold in the spring of this past year. And I really think that this just shows that uh, U.S. consumers are seeing the realizing the benefits of electric vehicles and um, how they are here today. In the same vein, we are optimistic for future PEV market growth. Um, a number of awards in the past year have been given to plug-in electric vehicles, 2011 World Car of the Year, Green Car Vision Award, 2013 Motor Trend Car of the Year. The automakers are also supportive and have shown that they are not just putting out a couple compliance vehicles, but they're growing their offerings from 2009 to 2013. You can see that um, in 2013 there will be 15 new PEV models entering the market throughout this year, there were. And then uh, once consumers buy their PEV, they're having positive experiences, and they've, in response to a J.D. Power & Associates survey, over 80% of PEV owners intend to purchase another PEV in the future. Why do we care about workplace charging as opposed to public charging stations or multi-unit dwellings? Um, we have noticed that out, out of everywhere a car is parked beyond the home, the workplace is obviously the number one place where you're going to have a long duration of time, six and a half to eight plus hours, as opposed to leader destination shopping center and travel stops. So. It's also estimated that 50 million PEV drivers will require workplace charging or public charging to make their daily commute. Many of these vehicles, uh, many of these individuals live in multi-unit or urban dwellings where they lack access to home charging. So employers have the opportunity to help fill the workplace charging gap in America's infrastructure and provide greater transportation opportunities for employees. Workplace charging is valuable to not only current PEV drivers, but potential PEV drivers as well. It alleviates a significant concern for current PEV drivers um, by potentially doubling the distance that an electric vehicle can drive each day, so which allows then for more spontaneity in their driving patterns, whether it's picking up um, groceries after work or going to an appointment. And it also adds to electric vehicle miles traveled. And we've always thought that there has been great value, and we've seen already the great value that the workplace the workplace can serve as a second showroom for electric vehicles. So if you're going to talk to your coworker about the movie that they saw this weekend or where they're going on vacation this um, summer, you're going to talk to them about that really cool car that they have parked in the parking lot as well. You're going to be able to have tangible evidence of someone like you who is driving a plug-in electric vehicle and living very comfortably and happily with that decision. So just having it in their lives, it helps potential PEV drivers have a better understanding of the technology. So we started the Workplace Charging Challenge, um, and so far we have, and that's what we'll go into next with the benefits and um, our ideas for the Workplace Charging Challenge has been about, so far we have 52 employers, and a number of which are represented in Cutter's Best Workplaces community, Cisco, EMC Corp, Google, NetApp, NIPA, Raytheon, the Venetian and the Palazzo, Verizon and Zappos are the ones that that, I've, that I see. Um, we launched this workplace charging challenge in earlier this year in 2013, and the main goal of the workplace charging challenge is to grow the nation's charging infrastructure to increase consumer awareness of PEV technology by supporting our employers' efforts in their decisions to establish workplace charging programs. 
we aim to achieve a tenfold increase in the number of employers offering workplace charging by 2018. And we are accepting new interest daily. Um, uh, we just had Baxter sign on last week, so I really want to stress that if there are any interested parties um, that are employers offering workplace charging on the phone today, that we want to continue to be in touch about um, your interest in joining these employers in their efforts. So we think that the benefits of workplace charging can really be bundled into three main categories, incentivizing employees, complementing sustainability efforts, and signaling corporate leadership. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to explain in a testimonial case study example of how our existing, some of our existing partner employers have realized these benefits. So on the the screen here is a small company out of Southern California called Lynda.com. And Lynda is a 350-person business. Um, and when they were searching for a new candidate for one of their positions, this, employee, this potential employee came to them and suggested that if they installed a workplace charging station for them, they may be more interested in accepting the offer. So ultimately, Lynda.com did install the charging stations, and the employee was hired. And now they have a number of other employees who have decided to purchase plug-in electric vehicles. I think that there are up to seven or eight additional employees that have, have purchased PEVs. And I think that Lynda.com definitely realizes that that would not have happened if they had not installed the charging station themselves. And the employees have been very satisfied uh, with, with this charging station. Many em employers have a, a large focus on sustainability these days. And what we want to show is how workplace charging can be integrated into those sustainability efforts and how workplace charging can help cut scope three emissions um, due to employees' commutes. Charging stations at the workplace can be eligible for uh, points under the Green Building Council's LEED certification process, and th they can also uh, count towards the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Scope 3 Emissions Reductions. So those are things that we are helping our current partners understand more how that works, and um, see those benefits are possible. Additionally, other companies like JLA Public Involvement, a very small business in Portland with 15 employees, uh, they were able to receive a, as part of their efforts um, when sustainability, their PEV charging station helped them receive Portland Sustainability at Work program. So they now have one shared plug-in electric vehicle for the workplace and then they have three employees who have decided to purchase PEVs as a result of the charging station um, offering at work as well. So JLA has seen, you know, their sustainability efforts complemented by their charging station. In the next example, you can't talk about workplace charging without talking about Google. And I think that Google gives the perfect example of why they have decided to really take on such a, a great leadership role in becoming uh, leaders in workplace charging. So Google has 25,000 employees and currently has 300 charging stations for those employees across the country. Their goal is to provide charging at 5% of their total parking spaces. And Google has really been a, a champion of sharing their lessons learned with others and you know, their leadership has been realized um, by our community, certainly, and they invite others to join them in this as well. The structure of the Workplace Charging Challenge is really three categories. Um, what DOE is doing in this partnership, what our ambassador organizations are doing, and what our partner organizations are doing. DOE provides employers with, through this program with technical assistance 
and access to a network of other partners to share best practices with. DOE also is recognizing the success in offering opportunities to those partners to highlight their, um, the success of their workplace charging programs. Ambassadors are the second category of participation, and ambassadors are stakeholder organizations that work to promote and support workplace charging across the country. So our Clean Cities coalitions are our built-in ambassador network, which we're fortunate to have access to, and they've been very supportive of the workplace charging efforts in their communities. So our typical ambassador organizations are um, trade associations, nonprofits, both from the industry and um, consumer side, like EDTA, Plug in America, CalSTAR, and so on. So partner is the actual heart of the program. Partner is the employer who pledges to provide workplace charging for their employees. As a partner, an employer commits to developing and executing a partner plan at a minimum of one major employer location with a best practice goal of meeting all of the PEV driving employee demand at that location. As I mentioned, DOE has um, really made an effort to highlight and recognize the efforts of these employers. When we first started this activity, even some of our most senior leadership questioned, are there employers out there offering this benefit? And when we looked into it, we saw that it was kind of difficult to determine who had this benefit because it is not something that employers are really, for the most part, going out there and touting. It's an internal employee benefit, so it doesn't make the necessarily the best press release, but we wanted to try to change that and really highlight what these employers are doing. So what I have up on the screen now is an interactive map that you can access on our website that each of the dots when you hover above them will link to a partner profile that says what our different partner companies are doing in each of these locations across the country where workplace charging is offered. So if you don't see your company on this map, I definitely recommend that this is a great um, benefit of, of joining this program to signal to your community, to potential employees, to other companies and other employers that you're offering this um, benefit and that you, you have taken on this initiative to install workplace charging. Secondly, I mentioned the partner profiles that each company gets on the Department of Energy website that highlights the basics about their program and their company, links to their sustainability reports or other places on their website where it talks about what they are doing, and also has a place for photos, videos, and, and press releases. And finally, our efforts here in social media, on our website, blogs, press releases, we are continually looking for other opportunities to get out the word about what our partner companies are doing because our ultimate goal is to make people realize that workplace charging is not the exception and that this is becoming more commonplace and um, companies should really be considering taking this on if they're interested in adding to their sustainability efforts and their commuters portfolio of offerings. Here's a snapshot of a few of the headlines that we've been able to get through the challenge for our activity and our partners' efforts. And another slide as well about uh, signaling what our companies are doing through this activity. We've seen that by banding together, we often are able to to get some more mainstream attention for this activity. When we talk about DOE offering technical assistance, we're really looking at a few different categories of workplace charging solutions, whether it's these, you know, I'm not going to go through the list here, but there's a variety of issues that a employer may come across when they're installing workplace charging. Many times, companies are dealing with these questions for the first time, and, um, you know, we're working to educate employers 
really EV101 basics. So really starting off the process of what are the charging stations, what are charging stations, what are our options, what incentives are out there. Um, if I lease my property, how do I work with a property owner? What are, what are the requirements with the ADA compliance? Um, dealing with issues from permitting to zoning to electrical contractors, what kind of signage to use? And through the challenge, we're offering technical assistance and, and resources to support, um, technical resources to support these activities. The second category is under what we call our management and policy of a workplace charging program. This is really a new frontier for many companies. Deciding how they set up a, you know, a standard operating procedure around their workplace charging program is something that, that many companies have had some trials and errors on, and there are certainly a vast um, array of best practices that have come out of this. Um, for example, um, how to deal with employee fairness issues, whether you provide the electricity for free or whether you charge for it. Um, how do you handle the parking etiquette? Many companies we've seen, you know, at, at the start, they're employees, have, PEV driving employees are working very well together on internal listservs or distribution lists um, and message boards that, that help them communicate on how to um, move vehicles around if another employee needs it. These things are working now, but what happens as workplace charging grows? What happens as PEV adoption continues to increase and these um, these types of solutions no longer are, are workable. So we want to continue to work with employees on overcoming these issues. As I mentioned, the partner employer, one of the requirements that we are requiring of the employers is to develop a workplace charging program plan. And what we've seen is that many companies have installed their charging stations kind of as a one-off um, activity and don't necessarily have a longer-term plan for it or how they're going to handle it. We've seen even in one case where um, the company was not really able to, to keep up with the management of the charging stations and decided to issue a decree to other, um, other work sites that, that they no longer wanted to install these charging stations because there were issues coming up that they were not ready for. So for the partner plan, we want people, we want employers to think from start to finish, why are you doing this? How does it fit into your sustainability portfolio, your commuter offerings? What are your goals and how are you tracking the progress of what you're trying to do? How are you not only assessing the demand for charging stations from your employees at, up front, but on a continuing basis going forward? What are the management um, solutions that you're putting in place and addressing the types of issues that we talked about on the previous slide? And how did you go about your procurement and installation process, or how do you plan to? I should, you know, mention that, that this will hopefully be helpful for employers that have not yet installed their workplace charging program. We want to work with them to develop this plan. And then finally, what are the activities and programs that your company is going to continue to do going forward after those charging stations are in the ground? Um, we have charging stations here at the Department of Energy in the basement, but if you issued a survey, we really believe that the vast majority of employees wouldn't even know that they're there. So how are you continuing to educate your employees? Are you offering ride and drive? Are there other kinds of incentives that you're offering your employees? How are you thinking about integrating alternative fuel vehicles into your fleet? And so on. There are a lot of different examples here, and uh, DOE is developing, we're in the process of developing a suite of toolkit materials for employers to use here. So this is uh, about the last slide here, and this is just a, a call to continue the conversation if you're interested in workplace charging, whether it's supporting it and promoting it in your community. You know, we want to put you on our listserv to get all the up-to-date 
uh, information and resources that we have available on this topic out to you. If you're an employer who's already installed workplace charging, we want to work with you to highlight what you're doing and encourage you to do more and continue to do more. We know that um, many of our partners, the, the individual point of contact that we're working with at companies, have told us that you know, by being part of this, it helps them better make the case to their management to extend the pilot project to perhaps another location, that there's other benefits to be had. We want to talk more about the workplace charging challenge and, and have you be part of it, and we want to help you build a successful workplace charging program and continue to grow what you offer. Um, on the left-hand side here, this is a handbook. Um, this is a fifth in the Clean Cities Handbook series, PEV Handbook for Workplace Charging Hosts. And this gives you all the information that you need from basic EV 101 to um, starting to delve into some of the issues that we talked about on the previous slides. Our website also has and will continue to grow and expand other offerings that we have um, with targeted resources addressing specific issues. Um, and uh, we just really, really do hope to continue this conversation. And uh, my contact information here is on the last slide, and I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, and I think that we will open it up here for, for questions. Uh, yes, Sarah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder for those that want to submit a question, up for kind of in the upper left-hand corner of your screen area, you should see a Q&A. Uh, click on that, and you'll have the ability to submit your question. For We've already had several um, come in. Uh, in terms of, uh, Sarah, in terms of what are some of the, your thoughts about the future of workplace charging? One of the things that I, I see the folks at the labs and universities working on and I see a real interest from employers on is the ability to have a centrally managed system where the, all of the charging stations or charging stations in a, in a group, in a cluster, are centrally managed by the employer. They know how much charge each of the cars need. They know if they need to um, have folks move their vehicles. They also have a better understanding of what their demand is. And, and also, if they want to um, lower the energy flow based on the need of other activities that are happening um, with with uh, the electricity demand of, of the site, they can do that all from a central location. So I see that as definitely being one item. Um, I also see there being more uh, workplace charging um, in, in states and municipalities, and states and municipalities really working as leaders in you know, the charging station offerings that they have at their facilities for their employees and for guests in the community. That's also going to be really important. So those are just a couple of things. Okay. Well, thanks, Lynn. More questions are piling in here now, Sarah. Uh, the next question is, are there any financial incentives available to employers to install these charging stations, in particular from the federal government? Yes, there are. There is a currently a federal tax credit that employers can take advantage of that is up to 30% uh, of the cost of the installation. Um, there are also different state incentives that may be available. Um, and in other programs, for example, New York currently has a grant program that that is targeted to workplace charging installations. And uh, I can't pull it up on the screen here, but if you write down um, our the Department of Energy's AFDC, that stands for the Alternative Fuel um, Database Center, that has a incentives database for uh, pertaining to the the transportation area with alternative fuels, and you can click on EV incentives, and you'll find all the information about the, the federal tax credit and other incentives from the, the state level and from your util, perhaps your utility as well. All right. Uh, the next question is kind of, the first one is do you have funding? And I guess the next question should ask them first. So how much does the station cost initially, and what's the annual maintenance on average? 
this is something that, that we devote uh, two whole pages to answer this question in our workplace charging handbook that I pulled up on the screen there. Um, there are two kinds of charging stations, level one and level two. I should not say, I shouldn't limit it to two, but two of the most common ones are level one and level two, obviously also DC fast chargers. But in the workplace, we're most uh, commonly seeing level one and level two. The level one equipment ranges in cost from $500 to $1,000. It can also just be as simple as um, allowing an employee to access an outlet that you already have at your facility, which would essentially be a cost of zero. But if you were installing a, a, a standalone level one, it would be $500 to $1,000. Level two is costing, we're seeing costs of $500 to $7,000 on the, the high, high end. And in, when you see the, the real difference in cost there, it depends on the level of sophistication of those units. Um, features such as um, that I was talking about, you know, uh, safety features, lighting, uh, communication capabilities, keypads, um, all sorts of things that, that, can, that can serve as add-ons um, to those. And those costs are also before incentives. It's also really important to add the installation costs can vary. Um, and additionally to that, the installation cost can vary significantly based on how close the charging station installation that you're planning is to existing um, lines, uh, electrical lines, and whether you need to upgrade your um, electrical capabilities in those areas as well can can impact the, the cost. But that is one of, another one of the things that we're working with people on is we want to work to, to try to help you uh, find the, the most affordable options here. Sorry, next question is from, is currently we have some charging stations that are free of charge for employees, but questions have been asked about how to account for the electricity consumed to charge employee vehicles. The questions that I have are, are there any clear policies from organizations where we can be provided with to look at? Maybe, for example, do you share partner plans with others? And also, are there any issues for charging being considered a taxable benefit to employees? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and address the, the second part. Um, this is something that has come up in just about every workplace charging conversation that's had. And uh, I'll cut to the chase and say that at the federal level, we can't comment on these types of tax issues um, where there is confusion, and we suggest that you contact the IRS for more information on this question. But it is something that we have been working with IRS on to try to get better clarity on. Uh, if you, uh, I won't cite my own opinion here, but if you, you can see that many employers out there have differing opinions on whether offering free electricity to their employees is or is not a taxable benefit. At this time, what we can best tell you to do is have your um, financial lawyers, tax lawyers, contact the IRS and ask them that question. But we are working to get better clarity there, and we know that one of those answers will be more beneficial uh, to employers than the other, so we are certainly having um, some conversations there about that, and we, we really do hope to have clarification um, in, the, in the coming year or so on that issue. And your other question was, if I do charge my employees for uh, the electricity, what is the best, a best practice on the amount? And that's an example of something that we have helped other partners with on, you know, there's really not a one-size-fits-all. It depends a lot on the cost of your electricity in an area. Other things that you might want to consider um, in, in the cost there as well. So I would be, I think my email address is um, on the last slide, and I think Phil can type it here on the screen, but I'd be happy to talk to you more about that or any others um, about that question because there, are, there definitely are best practices on amounts to charge. Thanks, Sarah. I'm, while, we're, while I pull up the next question, I'll go ahead and pull up the web page that you were referring to, I believe. Thank you. So it should be on the screen, and it is a web page, so if somebody wants to explore it while 
Sarah's talking, you can you can do that as well. So the next the next question is: our, our site does not have enough parking for all of our employees. Thus, our commute program is primarily geared to remove cars from the parking lots. W what recommendations do you have for selling EV stations when they are in are in conflict with our program? You know, that's a really good question and one that we haven't really dealt with so much in the past um, because it hasn't we haven't seen it be an issue. I'd be really interested in, in working more with you on, on how to handle that. Um, what we've seen employers do is that becomes less of an issue when they have made the decision internally that they want to, and this is something that Verizon has said um, at our kickoff, is that they view the offering of charging stations to their employees the setting aside of those spots and the purchasing of those units as a reward for those employees um, for adopting plug-in electric vehicles, and that you know, they were willing to make the um, uh, negotiating that compared to the other commuter um, programs that they had because they were really looking at diversifying the offerings, and I think that that's kind of key is that um, we know that, that not everyone is going to take public transportation or take advantage of the carpooling. So for those in that other category that, that aren't going to opt into those programs, is this a program that can help cut down on emissions in, a, in an alternative way? So we should work on helping, helping the, you make your, your case to the, for that um, stronger and um, working on that issue. So I'd be very interested in continuing to talk to you about that. Okay, Sarah. Uh, the, still have several questions, and I'll pull up shortly the Q&A opportunity again. If people, again, click on the Q&A, and you, you should be able to enter it. The next question is, uh, what is a good argument to convince a state DOT to participate? After all, uh, PEVs do not generate gas taxes, which pay for transportation infrastructure? A great question. And uh, to address the issue about the, uh, the gas tax, we've seen a number of states in the process of adding a one-time or annual fee for EV drivers to help make up that difference. It's been uh, very uh, controversial in those states and others that are considering it. So I guess what I would say to that is it, that might not be an issue in your state much longer um, if they decide to go in this direction. Um, and I'd be happy to, to point you to the examples of the other states that are, are currently looking at this issue. Um, Oregon is one of them, um, but others are looking as well. And how to address this with a, the workplace charging at the, the state level, um, We I have a, a few examples of states that have shown interest in workplace charging and dealing with their various levels of bureaucracy to make that happen. Um, so uh, again, it's another example where I'd be happy to continue the conversation with you and um, put you in, in touch with the people that I know that are working on this in, in other states. I think that the answer is that this is such an early um, issue that states are, are dealing with that we're just kind of working with different states to figure out what the best practice for making this case and how it can work. Okay. Um, next question is, what's the likelihood of the federal tax credit being extended beyond 2013? Um, you know, I can't, I can't really speak to that, but I know that um, groups like EDTA and Plug in America are working hard to have that extended. Um, I know that um, I can only speak to, you know, the, the executive branch and that the executive branch is very supportive of electric vehicles and the funding of research and development and in the funding of deployment of these vehicles. So I imagine that the conversations are being had with the Hill on, on the importance of these tax credits still to this um, the, this early stage of EV deployment. All right. Thank you. Is Next question is, is there any documentation on best practices if an employer wants to implement a 
time limit and enforce a time limit? I imagine that the question is a, a time limit for each employee to be able to charge during a day and then would have to move their vehicle. Um, yeah. I would be happy to reach out to some of the employers that I know that have programs that, that are working like this, but I believe that, that currently the, major, the vast majority of employers are, are just really in this um, honeymoon period of, of their charging stations where employees are working well together and negotiating amongst each other on on how long the they're able to access the charge. Um, additionally, I know that, that some of the software that is available um, that, that charging station companies are working on may be capable of doing something like that, so I'd be happy to um, look into what the potential capabilities are there. All right. Is is there any guidance on the ratio of chargers to parking spaces yet? What should we be planning for? This is a, a perfect question that we are working on right now with um, Idaho National Laboratory. Um, I think that there's there's two ways to answer this. There's the the theoretical scientific answer um, that we've already you know put together based on. This is the average amount of miles that the that a PEV driving employee would potentially commute in a given day, and here's potentially in a workday how many hours um, the the vehicles would need to charge and and how to balance that. And we have that scientific type of an answer, but when you take that and put it in the real world and see what the real needs are, it's very different. So what we're doing now is we're working with Idaho National Labs to conduct an analysis, an examination of data that has been collected through a program that many of you may be familiar with. It's called the EV Project. Um, it was a Recovery Act project that um, deployed 17-some thousand charging stations in the U.S., and um, it was really an effort to collect this type of data. So we're working with them to develop such a best practice. That really goes in line with one of our um, starting recommendations to companies is to, um, first and foremost, do a survey of your employee base at a given location or at multiple locations, determining what employees are looking for. How many miles are they are they commuting during a, um, in, a, in a day to work? What are their prospects for purchasing a PEV if they don't already have one? And that's one resource that we already have up on our website, um, that survey, so that once you get those results, we want to work with you to try to determine what's the best um, option for that EVSE to PEV ratio. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Um, and our next question is, <clears throat> should employers charge for the power used by employees for their personal vehicles and with the bankruptcy of ecotality, what is the availability and support for charging infrastructure? So um, we'll take those two questions. Can you repeat the first half of the question? Sure. The, fir the first part was, should employers charge employees basically for the power? I think that it's very much up to the employer. However, there has been, um, from a behavioral science perspective, there has been um, argument uh, from uh, a number of uh, our researchers, perhaps out at one example is Tom Turrentine's group out at UC Davis, um, Gail Tal and um, Michael Nicholas out there just released a paper talking about this, this issue. And their argument is that it is it really should be a best practice for employers to not offer free electricity to their employees because it prevents employees from not charging during the off-peak hours at night if they want the free ride of charging during the day. It also promotes uh, the better the better pattern of usage among employees 
if only the ones that are at least willing to pay for it, um, even if it's at cost of electricity. Um, so there's a number of arguments there, and uh, if you follow up with me after this, I'd be happy to send you a link to that report if, if you're interested for more information on what they've studied. So you really have to, um, this is the, the classic policy question of offering it for free to incentivize as a benefit or making employees charge to um, create better behavior in the longer term. And the second part of the question was, um, what is the, the support for, I imagine that this is more of a sort of a theoretical question of what's the federal level support for charging stations and charging station infrastructure out after um, the ecotality bankruptcy. And it's another uh, classic media training where I, I can't comment on the bankruptcy or the arrangement there, but I'm also happy to put you in touch with the right um, lawyers <laughs> for more information about that. Um, but I do believe that we are, um, the department is, is optimistic to uh, continue the working on the vast uh, amount of data that we've been able to collect over the past few years from these charging stations. It really has been a success from that st standpoint and what we've been able to obtain. Remember, again, that this was a deployment project, um, and and uh, we, we have been able to get a great amount of information. And uh, I think that the federal government will continue to support charging station deployment um, in ways such as the through Clean Cities, this program that I'm working on, in ways that we can continue to, to support uh, the deployment. And uh, we're doing a lot of work. Uh, we have a proposal in FY14 budget that has obviously not yet been approved by Congress um, for activities on grid integration. So we really want to be looking and working with utilities on, on how charging stations and uh, EVs are going to impact the grid. So we still have a lot of work left to do, and in our deployment efforts, a lot of support to offer, um, technical support to offer. Well, and, a, and a kind of a nice follow-up that somebody else had submitted is, well, how would you advise a company in choosing an EV manufacturer or company, given that such instability like eco-totality going bankrupt? That's a great question. Um, being DOE, we, the federal government, we can't point you to a specific company or suggest a company to use or not use. But the first thing that we'll do is point you to both Plug in America and EDTA have uh, product catalogs. That's the first thing to, to at least see the variety of offerings that are out there. Secondly, I would point you to uh, work that we've done in conducting the testing of these different units. So you want to know if, if um, what our our results are on the quality and what we're finding when we're we're testing these units, and that's publicly available. So I have that information if folks are interested as well. And then thirdly, I would urge you to take a look at our partner map. Find a company who's has a dot close to you on the map or has, um, is in your industry or, or some, something else, contact me and I'm happy to put you in touch with the right people at those companies to talk about their experiences. Um, I think that that's the best way to really learn what's working out there, what's not working, what uh, benefits have been of using different manufacturers. And, and challenges that companies have seen. So that's another thing that we want to do with our workplace charging challenge is, again, is have this network of sh information sharing. And we, our, our existing partners have shown a great interest in sharing information and these experiences for other companies that are interested. We've been very fortunate with that. Okay. We have uh, time for two more questions. And have you had any success in mitigating utility demand charges? I'm not sure if mitigating would be the right word, but I have we have had great success in engaging the utilities in this activity. If you um Phil, if you jump back to the slide with the logos, you can see that not only do we have automakers on board as part of this activity offering 
charging stations to their employees, but we also have the utilities. And the utilities are the ones that we're really working with to, to have those discussions. San Diego Gas and Electric, to me, has been a huge leader on examining this issue and working with employers in their area um, on this challenge. And if, if folks aren't familiar with the demand charges, um, uh, commercial purchasers of electricity have a certain level of demand that they receive one rate at, and if they go over that level of demand, um, perhaps with the charging stations adding to their load, um, they will incur additional charges that are at a much higher rate than their usual cost. And this is obviously a concern to facility managers um, and the like at different companies. So what we're trying to do is work with those companies and those individuals to get a better, help them get a better understanding of what their load is going to look like and working with the utilities in their areas, especially if they're a partner under our program, um, to try to come up with um, solutions there. So mitigating might not be the right word, but working and having these conversations to identify this issue and, and figure out how we can work with the utilities um, better on that is a huge part of what we're doing. Okay. Well, we're addressing the final question. I'll go ahead and pull up the uh, evaluation. For those that have an opportunity, please take a few minutes and let us know, give us feedback on today's webcast. The, sir, the final question is, or multiple questions actually, is given costing considerations, hardware and depreciation, installation, electricity, in many cases at the most expensive time of day, staffing, et cetera, what are the emissions reductions an employer could expect for, per PEV switch from a standard, whatever, 30 mile per gallon gasoline vehicle? Are we just changing the emission source? And how would the value per dollar be compared to providing transit passes by eliminating emissions and reducing congestion? Well, this is a long but very good question that, that has a long answer that I don't have specific numbers to give you right here on the phone. Um, but one thing I want to work with Phil to do is answer this question and on paper and send it out to the entire group of folks that are interested because it is a very good question. In the short, in the short, uh, short form answer is that when people have this question, we've been directing them to a couple calculators that we have. And what we're trying to do here is compare the calculation of the scope to emissions that a work site has, um, from resulting from the use of the additional use of the electricity to the scope three emissions for the average um, vehicle. And this really depends on the electricity that your company is purchasing in a given area. So our calculators are able to, to offer that comparison. And in some parts of the country, it's accurate to say that um, the the, 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 the balance may not be in the favor of what we're trying to do here, that there may be additional emissions from the electricity. But that is going to be a, a very rare instance um, where the, uh, the fuel mix is very poor and very carbon intensive, um, but that is going to be in very rare cases. Um, so, and in terms of the dollar amount, um, and, and the dollar value there, um, we would need to do a little bit more work on answering your question fully, but I do want to address this answer to, to all the folks on the call, so I want to, to work on some additional analysis and, and get back to you all. So thank you for asking that question. And thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's been a real informative, and as you can tell by the series of questions, very engaging for the audience. Um, we'd like to thank everybody for attending, and again, if you have the, uh, please, a couple minutes just to complete the evaluation, we would greatly appreciate it. So on behalf of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida, we wish you a good day. Goodbye.